Well, good morning, everybody, from a rather festive Almaty. Check it out. You can see the beautiful Christmas tree behind me. I've just made it in the middle of the night to the largest city in Kazakhstan. And actually, it's my second time here in the last seven months. I was here over the summer, slightly different weather conditions back then, and I was blown away by the sheer beauty of the city. And one other thing, which is that more than 30 years after Kazakhstan's independence, well, from the old Soviet Union, the city still remains quite Soviet in a lot of ways. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking around, we're going to be looking at some of Kazakhstan's history, Soviet heritage, and basically just checking out how incredibly uh, spectacular Almaty really is. So join me on what I think will be, hopefully, a fairly epic adventure across Almaty. So getting ready to actually enter the memorial to the Soviet heroes of the Red Army who sacrificed their lives during what the Soviets call the Great Patriotic War. And in particular, the park that we're in is named for Ivan Panfilov, who headed up what was known as the 316th Rifle Division, which was a predominantly Kazakh and Kyrgyz division. And they fought valiantly in the Battle of Moscow in 1941. Every city within the former Soviet Union has what's known as the eternal flame. Well, not sure what they've actually done with these in Ukraine, but <laughs> here in Kazakhstan, certainly the eternal flame continues to burn. Basically, you know, marking, celebrating, remembering the heroes of the Soviet Red Army who died in the defense of the fatherland between 1941 and 1945. So Nazi German forces invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941 in what was known as Operation Barbarossa. To this day, it remains the single bloodiest invasion in the history of warfare. An estimated 40 million people died on the Eastern Front, including an estimated 24 to 27 million Soviets. And the thing is, every republic within the Soviet Union played its role. And Kazakhstan, which today is the ninth largest country in the world, you can imagine that it played a significant part, uh, not only in the defense of, for example, Moscow, as we talked about with the 316th Rifle Division, but also the fact that a lot of enterprises, a lot of industry, it was actually moved inwards. It was actually moved towards Kazakhstan or into Kazakhstan uh, because it was deemed to be a safer place. One thing that I love about this memorial is that here you have all of the different hero cities of the Soviet Union. So, you know, we're not just paying tribute to Almaty or to Kazakhstan, we're paying tribute to all of the different cities and republics of the Union. Um, we have to recall that this was a, you know, multinational force that actually broke the back of the Nazi German army. So it's actually not just a memorial dedicated to those who fell in the Great Patriotic War. It's actually also a memorial to the Red Army soldiers who died in the Civil War, which ended up being the war that ultimately led to the creation of the Soviet Union in 1922, the one fought between the Reds or the Bolsheviks, the revolutionaries you could say, and then the Whites or the counter-revolutionaries on the other side. You know, one thing that's quite striking about Almaty is just how ethnically diverse it really is. And that's really true of Kazakhstan as a whole. You know, Kazakhstan is a country that comprises more than 130 different nationalities that call themselves Kazakhstanis. So there's actually a discrepancy between Kazakhs or ethnic Kazakhs and Kazakhstanis. You might be one, but not necessarily the other. Now, Kazakhstani statehood, its foundations didn't start in 1991. It actually started with the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. This was a revolution that really propelled the formerly oppressed nations and ethnic minorities in the Russian Empire to equal status. So in the 1920s, 
you had a project known as nativization in which basically you know all of the different national cultures and languages begin to finally flourish you know gain sort of equal footing with with russian and as time goes on this begins to ebb a little bit by the early 1930s you have a big famine in kazakhstan and roughly 40 percent of the ethnic kazakh population dies as a consequence of that and then later in the 1930s with the gulag system kazakhstan actually becomes you could say a dumping ground for a lot of different ethnic minorities and nations who are deported uh, during the period of joseph stalin and then after this you know kind of on the eve of the second world war kazakhstan is already much more ethnically diverse than they probably intended it to be and then after the war you have something known as the virgin lands campaign which is a desire to boost agricultural production and what ends up happening is a lot of ethnic russians start to move to kazakhstan as a consequence of that so as time goes on kazakhstan becomes actually the only union republic within the USSR, in which the nation that it was named for was not a majority. Now, things have changed, but today, still in Almaty, around 20% of the population is ethnically Russian. And Russian is still the lingua franca. It's the common language you'll hear basically everywhere on the streets. If you were wondering what we were just looking at, that very grand appearing lobby, that was actually inside of the Hotel Kazakhstan, which is the most prominent landmark in Almaty. In fact, it's so prestigious in a sense that it's on the Kazakh currency, the tenge. It's on the 5,000 tenge note, which I think I have one somewhere, but uh, I'll show you later. Anyway, uh, check out the grandeur of the building. So it dates back to 1977. And actually the thing about the hotel is that it used to be run by Intourist, which was the Soviet, you could say, tourism agency. And inside of the Hotel Kazakhstan, it's quite interesting. There's two hotels, really. I mean, okay, it's one, but two in a sense, because if you look on booking.com or something like that, you're going to find uh, bookings available for the Hotel Kazakhstan. What you're going to get is a nicely sort of refurbished, updated, modern room. And then if you book the Kazakhstan Express, you might notice that the address is the same. So the Kazakhstan Express is within the Hotel Kazakhstan, and you'll get a very, well, let's put it this way, Soviet room, which is what I opted for. Uh, we'll have a look at the room later on. Let me just say, what an absolutely stunning piece of architecture this is, the Opera House. I mean, my goodness, really makes you feel like you're in the heart of the old Russian Empire, or the Soviet Union for that matter, but I mean, I don't know if the, the video footage will even do it justice. I mean, being up close and personal with it, it, it's truly, I mean, it's really astounding. And of course, there's a nice Christmas tree over here as well. <laughs> All right, across from the Opera House, from one Soviet hotel to the next, we have the iconic Almaty Hotel, which of course back in the day would have been called the Alma-Ata Hotel. This one actually dates back to the late 1960s, and if I remember correctly, there's some pretty epic Soviet mosaic work. You know, to me, the most interesting aspect of this hotel by a long shot is the fact that this guy right here, and you may never have heard of him, I mean, I certainly haven't until recently, a guy by the name of Rakimjan Koshkarbaev. He was actually the director of this hotel for, I believe, more than 20 years, from 1967 to 1988. And why is he significant? Well, because he was actually the first Soviet Red Army soldier to hoist the victory banner over the Reichstag in Berlin in May of 1945. Now, I believe that he is not actually the person hoisting the flag in this photo. If I remember correctly, it was done in the middle of the night. They couldn't actually capture it. But nonetheless, he is well regarded as a hero uh, in Kazakhstan and across the former Soviet Union for what took place at that time. 
sort of getting chills being here, just looking at the story of Koshkarbaev and, you know, to think about the fact that I live in Berlin now, I live in, you know, what used to be East Berlin, but I walk basically to the Reichstag almost every single day uh, because I work as a tour guide often there. And the thing is, you know, a lot of people who visit Berlin, they have this perception that, ah, oh, it was the Soviets that, you know, they made it to Berlin first, basically. But a lot of folks would actually see the Soviets as, I guess, a synonym for Russia. The thing is, the vast majority of the Soviet soldiers who died in Berlin in April and May of 1945 were not Russians. Most were Ukrainians, Belarusians, uh, there was a Polish uh, component as well, and of course people from all of the other republics of the Soviet Union, including right here in Kazakhstan. And Koshkarbaev's story really drives that home. So what an amazing, amazing experience to be able to be here, um, you know, having just come from Berlin. Okay, trivia time. Who is the father of the Kazakhstani nation? Is it Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who basically oversaw Kazakhstan's turn towards capitalism and also its independence? Or is it this guy behind me? A guy by the name of Dinmukhamed Kunayev. Now, if you've never heard of Kunayev, he was effectively leader of Soviet Kazakhstan from the mid-1960s until 1986. And a lot of people that I've spoken to here in Almaty have told me we love Kunayev way more than we ever could love Nazarbayev. Now we are properly into the metro. I had no idea where to put the token for a second, but a single ride costs 100 tenge, which I gave a 2,000 tenge note. So I got 1,800 and change because I decided to get two tokens. 100 tenge is basically, I gotta do the math on that later. I'm not used to actually uh, having to spend so little, but it's effectively nothing as most metro systems in the former Soviet Union tend to be. Very clean. Uh, very efficient, at least that's what they say. We'll see how long it takes for one of the trains to get here. But I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go about one to two stops and we'll just get off and check out some of the stations and the way that they look. Man, not a single bit of dirt, <laughs> not a single bit of garbage, rubbish, whatever you wanna call it. Incredibly, incredibly clean. And yes, this is not actually a Soviet era metro system. It was commissioned starting in 1988, but actually in the early 1990s with the privatizations and the chaos that reigned in the former USSR, the plans were initially put on hold. Eventually, they got their shit together and actually the metro ends up opening in, I believe 2010 or 2011. And just like that, we've made it one stop to Baikonur. Man, what a cool experience. Now, if you've been to the metro in Moscow or something like that, then this might not be much to marvel at, but very clean, very efficient. I did have to wait about seven and a half minutes, but I guess this city isn't in such a rush or people can just plan their, you know, um, getting on the metro according to the timetable, stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, just 20 cents more or less for a ride. So 
you know, you can't really knock that at the end of the day. Well, there is a very, very sweet smell of chocolate in the air. The chocolate aroma has permeated all of Almaty at this point. And that's because here you have the Rakat factory, sort of, well, nationally renowned and somewhat internationally renowned as well. Its origins go back to the evacuation of enterprises from other parts of the Soviet Union to Kazakhstan during the war. So there were two candy factories, one in Moscow and one in Kharkiv, and actually they were moved here here to Alma-Ata. Now Rakat became sort of nationally and internationally renowned and actually nowadays it's owned by Lotte, so a South Korean company. Go figure. Hey, check it out. It's an ice rink with two people partaking in skating on a Wednesday afternoon at 1 p.m. Amazing. And over here on this side, a grand, grand Soviet building. Man, talk about breathtakingly beautiful. I don't know if you can get a sense of how actually immaculate this place really is. I mean, no snow in Almaty City, but come up here 20 minutes to the mountains and you've been transported to Switzerland. I know a lot of people say that. They say, oh, you know, the uh, Alps in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, it's like the Central Asian Switzerland, but it's really in a league of its own. But what we have here, we actually have something known as the Medeu Sports Complex and Ice Rink, which is the most elevated outdoor ice rink in the world. Goes back to 1972. This was a period where basically First Secretary Kunaev had lobbied General Secretary Brezhnev for the creation of a massive ice rink and sports complex here outside of what used to be Alma-Ata. What they realized, and this is when the Soviets were really excelling at winter sports, is that the Kazakh speed skaters were particularly fast. So this was all part of building up a unified Soviet sports program uh, to really, you know, excel globally. So December of 1986, Kunaev is booted from power unceremoniously by Mikhail Gorbachev. So Gorbachev during this period is basically formulating his reform program, Glasnost and Perestroika, and he accuses Kunaev of mismanagement and corruption in Kazakhstan. Now, he ends up replacing Kunaev with somebody known as Gennady Kolbin. Kolbin was Russian. Kolbin had never worked in Kazakhstan. And almost certainly, he was viewed by people here as an outsider. I mean, sure, he was Soviet, but he wasn't Kazakh. And that was actually quite important. So ultimately, there are huge demonstrations here in what was at that time Alma-Ata, and perhaps hundreds of people are killed. We'll never know, perhaps, the actual number of people who are gunned down in the streets. Now, this is called the December Uprising. And historically, looking back at it, some people would say this was really a precursor to other nationalist demonstrations that ultimately will help to break up, to fragment the Union. Now, it'll also get said that these were anti-Soviet protests. And on the surface, that's certainly true. You know, Gorbachev was in power and, you know, Kolbin, his associate here in Kazakhstan. But actually, when you think about it, it was really Kunaev who was the quintessential communist, the quintessential man of the people, the quintessential, um, you know, representative of the Soviet system. And in memory of those killed in December of 1986 in Alma-Ata, now Almaty, you have, well, this woman representing liberty. Now, I'll say what's fascinating to me, and that's that Nazarbayev, you know, longtime president of Kazakhstan, has tried to basically say that he was always on the side of the protesters. There's allegations that that was not really true at the time, but retrospectively, he's basically tried to craft a different narrative. So one thing that they say is essential to do in Almaty is to take the six minute cable car journey up to the Koktobe, to the Blue Hill. Unfortunately, I am terrified of heights and more than anything else, cable cars scare the shit out of me. So this is something I've been putting off, but uh, <laughs> let's do it anyway.
Окей, спасибо. Just like that we're in. My goal is to get as close to the TV tower as possible. I live in Berlin and I live right next to the Fernsehturm or TV tower in that city. So I'm very fond of towers and nothing quite screams Soviet like television towers. And this one does look pretty spectacular. Well, I guess this is the main reason people come up here in addition to all of the stuff there is for kids and families to do. It's all about the view. First of all, let's check out the mountains. Second of all, Almaty itself. Beautiful, beautiful Almaty. And I suppose a great time to be here with the sun setting in about 20 minutes. Uh, you know, I got excited for a second. This had all the appearances of being something from the Soviet period, but it's actually a little bit more recent. But can we all agree this is quite extraordinarily beautiful? gondola to ourselves that's actually rather terrifying i wish somebody was riding this with me oh man well you know better down than up i suppose oh it's nighttime too so i'm not sure if that's going to make it better or worse to be fair okay this is just absolutely spectacularly beautiful i'm going to pretend as if we are not basically floating above ground. I know that's not the technical or scientific expressions for any of this, but um, yeah, this is, this is horrifying and yet so majestically beautiful at the same time. Edging ever closer to the Hotel Kazakhstan, which is how I know that we are almost there and we're almost on the ground. So I guess that's a fairly obvious point as well. I did it. I didn't do it for me, I did it for you, I did it for the views. <laughs> but I'm glad that you came along with me on this journey. I felt as if you were all here with me throughout this horrific, horrific, horrific ordeal. Welcome to the Kazakhstan Express, or, I mean, it's really the Hotel Kazakhstan, but yeah, this is one of the old rooms, pardon the mess, but I figured I would just show you what, you know, $60 more or less gets you here per night. I mean, we're talking about the most iconic location possible. <laughs> Tremendous. I mean, let me just show you the view real quick. I mean, look at this. <laughs> this is just absolutely unbeatable. Ridiculously beautiful. Wow. All right, check it out. Barely five minutes into our journey this morning and we've already encountered the first of the socialist artwork. Definitely shows that we are in the former Soviet Union. But if you come down here, down the steps, that looks mighty familiar. Wait a minute. This is actually a Burger King. So, wait, the side of the old Arman Cinema or Kino is now a Burger King. And around the other side, I believe, there's something known as a Starbucks coffee. So, uh, yeah, you can definitely tell that capitalism was restored here in 1991. What's interesting, though, is that Kazakhstan was actually the last of the Soviet republics to leave the USSR. In fact, for a few days, Kazakhstan was the entirety of the Soviet Union. Do you want to get married at the church? Do you want to get married at the mosque? Or do you want to get married at the Soviet wedding palace? Looks like a UFO, doesn't it? Wow. 
Well, as the old saying goes, all good things must inevitably come to their conclusion. And we are getting ready to head out of Almaty after an incredible 72 hours exploring the city's Soviet heritage. But before we do that, I mean, first things first, I owe you an apology because I did say that I was going to show you the Kazakhstani Tenga, the banknote with the Hotel Kazakhstan on it. And unfortunately, on the way over here, the taxi driver actually took that last note from me. So I owe you one for next time that we actually return here we got to make it happen. Anyway, one more thing to show you uh, in light of the fact that I could not show you the banknote. How about this sexy Soviet bus station? Check that out in all of its glory. All right, next stop, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. So if you've enjoyed this video, stay watching, stay tuned. I think we're going to have some more epic adventures together across Soviet Central Asia.